something that I found quite fascinating while I was reading your work was this I do not think is fair. He's not your enemy by any stretch of the imagination, no, no. but it is still funny to to see how glowingly and admiringly, admiringly you write about his technical ability and his physical intuition when he's a string theorist. Yeah, yeah. I think that was just interesting to read. Well, yeah, no, I, anyway, there's a lot to say about him, but, but he's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, he, he personally had his own choices and his own... Um, Talents, you know, ha, you know, have just had a huge effect on the subject since you know, starting around the time when I was a student. I, I yeah, actually can you met tell him. his story, like who he is, just for people who don't know who he is and where he came from. Yeah, so actually, well, his father is a physicist, and so I'm a Lewis Witten. But he, um, any, yeah, he, so where, where to start with this? I mean, he he didn't actually start out studying mathematics. I think you know he had studied a lot on his own and learned a lot about. It, but he he majored, I think, in was it history? And, and he was studying history and economics and thinking of working as a political, as a journalist or in politics. And, and then at some point, I think he realized that his true talents lay in the field of his father. And he then came to Princeton. Um, and I think he was actually admitted, not in the physics department, but in the applied math program. And then, but then immediately started working in the physics department and working with David Gross. And this was just a year or two, a couple of years after the, um, couple, yeah, a couple of years after the standard model had fallen into place. So there was a huge amount of work going on of people trying to understand the implications of the standard model. And Gross had been one of the ones most responsible for for that. And he, um, anyway, and, and you know, he he's, he's just uh, anyway, any no, any if anybody's a genius, uh, Edward is genius. And so he, yeah, you know, and I even remember talking to people who were there in Princeton at the time as a student, and one of them told me, you know, uh, he ruined an entire generation of, of physics students there because they saw this guy come in who didn't really even know that much about the subject, and within a year or two, he was knew far more than they did and was doing all this amazing stuff, so they figured, you know, I must be an incompetent. And, mm-hmm. and so, and so he, that, that's somewhat of a joke. But, uh, but he, anyway, he then went on to, he, he became a postdoc at, at Harvard where I, I first met him. He actually agreed. To, I was looking for somebody to do a reading course with, and I, he, I would go and talk to him so often. He explained some things about quantum field theory to me, and he was a, you know, and he's a, just a truly remarkable person. And he, I, I then went to Princeton as a graduate student. He became a full professor at Princeton. I think a year a year or so after I got there, you know, I had a, you know, so anyway, he. If you know the subject, you know that you know going from being a graduate student to being postdoc for a couple of years to being a full professor at Princeton is not the way things mm-hmm. normally go. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think most people think well, the, the biggest mistake the Harvard Physics Department ever made in its well, it was not doing everything to keep him there and not making him a, a full professor and making sure he stayed at Harvard. But then you know while I was at Princeton, he was. He, I mean, he was just doing amazing things. He was just kind of revol- revolutionizing the field and all these. In quantum field theory? In quantum field theory, just within the standard model, mostly. He was just, um, you know, the, the big problem was really how do you understand these strong interactions that we didn't have any good calculational tools for understanding strong interactions. And he was just coming up with these amazing ideas about how to think about the strong interactions that within the context of, this, of the standard model, which just were kind of revolutionary and involved all sorts of, he was bringing all sorts of new mathematics into it. He was spending a lot of time talking to mathematicians, and um, like Michael Latia, and he was learning a lot of mathematics. So it was these kind of writing these beautiful papers, amazing mathematics, amazing new ideas, and r- serious connections between physics and math. And it was, it, I mean, he just had you know he was everybody was just looking at this in, in amazement. And then I went to um, became a postdoc, and then I heard the, that. Um, Later that fall, that you know, okay, you know, Witten has 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 gotten very interested in string theory, and he's now telling everybody, you know, that he's started writing papers. He's working full time in string theory. He's writing papers on string theory, and he's telling everybody, you know, that this is this is really, really the greatest thing in the world. And pretty much every postdoc I know was a friend of mine at one point had told me a story of, oh, I went down to Princeton to talk to Witten about what I'm doing, and he told me, oh, you know, that's very very nice, but you really should be doing string theory because that's what's What's, what happened? So that's, I don't know if that, 
I mean, the story kind of goes on. That, that's, that's kind of the beginning of it. But um, the, the later parts of the story that I tried to tell and not even wrong are um, about, often about, you know, in between working on string theory, he also just were, had these revolutionary ideas about the relationship between quantum field theories and mathematics and so-called topological quantum field theories. So he ended up, re, you know, completely revolutionizing one area of mathematics. Four-dimensional topology was just kind of completely blown apart by, by these, these, these new ideas that he brought into it. <clears throat> and, you know, so over the years, I mean, he, he was just doing these amazing things. But, and then, but then there's, he was also working on string theory, and there's, anyway, so there's, you know, I have very, very mixed feelings about that period. On the one hand, you know, he was doing these things, I think I just was a spectacular thing that <clears throat> no one else could have done, that I, ideas that I think are beautiful and truly love. On the other hand, he was pursuing this idea he was in love with about string theory, which I really think you know, was just not working. And, mm -hmm. uh, there is this very funny passage in your book, I thought it was funny, I liked it, where I don't. I think maybe you were visiting Princeton or something like that. You were following him up. Oh no, we went as a student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it was meant kind of as a joke, but to give that idea of. And and, and you know, it's actually a true story. So if if you know, Princeton, there's the there's the physics department and there's the math department. There's this plaza in between them. The library is underneath, and you come out of the library, you you come out of a, you come up a stairwell, and then you're in the middle of the plaza, and you can go either physics. And you know, so he was a little ways, a ways ahead of me and kind of went up the stairwell and then I got up the stairwell and there was no one there and, and it was kind of quite a ways to the, either one of those buildings. So I was the joke to people to look, you know, I think he, he knew, he didn't think anyone was around so he just teleported from, you know, one place to another. And, <laughs> but that, that, but it, it, it was certainly intended as a joke. I, I, I don't actually think he's a right, 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 alien, right, but, but the, um, I mean, he, he, he's definitely clearly someone able to do things that, you know, we, none of us knew anyone else who, who could, could do. Mm -hmm. Well, last Witten question. I'm just, this is just something I'm personally curious about. I've done something like 220 interviews for the show. I've interviewed some very accomplished scholars in their field, but some of them, just from talking to them, you wouldn't know that they have this totally genius mind. And I'm wondering if in just conversation with Witten, you can tell that he's thinking on a completely different genius level, or if it's something that just more comes out in his work. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it's, no. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he's actually, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say it, it, it's definitely something in his work, though, but, but certainly in the sense, you know, just listen, I mean, there's certain, some of his talks I've been at and were just these amazing experiences just to see that, but, um, you know, just if you before, yeah. I mean, anyway, he, he's an unusual person in some some sort of ways. But um, there are things you can say about that. But they're not um, those unusual personal characteristics. Don't don't really. You know, anyway, you know, those don't immediately say, "Oh, this person must be a genius." They might. Mm -hmm.